well, well, and I feel good, good, good. Well, I feel good down in my because there's something. Yes, that makes me feel good, good, good. Well, you know, and I have a love, love, love. And I have a love down in my because there's something about the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good, good. Well, you know, when I feel good, good, good. Well, and I feel good down in my because there's something by the spirit of because there's something by the spirit of because there's something by the spirit of Jesus that makes me feel good 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 amen let's pray dear heavenly father lord we thank you for bringing us here this morning to learn another portion of your word we just pray for its understanding, and we pray for its edification purposes. Lord, we thank you for those on their way. Please bless them to get her safely. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, teacher. All right, say it like you mean it. Good morning, boys and girls. Good morning, teacher. I am thrilled and delighted today. Uh, because uh, teaching this morning is one of our super talented and gifted young men. Um, Brother Davis is going to teach this class as uh, our regular teacher. Brother Ty Kelly continues to recover from surgery. Let's, let's uh, continue to be in prayer for him. Things went well. He's, he's coming along. But let's continue to be in prayer for him. But let's get our Bibles and with open Bibles and open hearts, let's, let's hear uh, the word of God uh, this morning. And then let's not just hear it, but let's heed it. Amen? Amen. Brother Davis. All right, good morning, church. Good morning. I hope you all are ready for uh, the day of the Lord. Um, this is the Lord, the day of the Lord. Let us rejoice and what? Be glad in it. Amen. Amen. So let us rejoice and be glad in it. I've always been taught that on Sundays our worship should begin before we even get to the building. Amen. And so I hope and pray that you all are ready and have a mindset to give this day uh, to the Lord. Uh, I thank you all for being here on this morning as well. And uh, just to, to give you a preface of, of what's happening. Um, I normally don't ask the preacher, can I, can I do anything in the church? I just wait for the opportunity. And um, that's kind of how I've been brought up. But some people um, need to understand about obedience. Anybody understand about obedience? Anybody like to be obedient? Well, well, all right. So when it, come, when it comes to God, I always try to exercise uh, my obedience. And um, God spoke to me. He says, you know, go ahead and, and talk to the preacher. He stirred me something up and um, woke up early one morning. And I said, you know, Lord, I don't really want to uh, want to do anything. I just want to kind of sit back. And he said, no, that's that's not what you're going to do. So call your preacher and, uh, and have a talk with him. So I thank uh, Brother Jones for the opportunity to, to allow me to be up here on this morning. And I hope we all can gain and, and maintain something from the lesson on today. Uh, we're going to continue the lesson on on dealing or directions for dealing with difficult people. All right, and just, um, so we don't really know each other that much, right? Um, I'm pretty new uh, to Rochester. I'm new to the congregation. Uh, my family knows me, of course, uh, and you know some of my family. But in general, we don't really know each other. We've never really hung out. Um, we haven't been to the movies together yet. You know, we haven't been out to dinner together yet. So we're going to get to know each other uh, a little bit through this, as well as as we go through, through ministry work together. Amen? So we're going to be working together as a team and as a church family. So let's, try, let's see if this is going to work out for us. All right, so advance for me, Sister Pam. This was working good. Oh, maybe if I turned it on, that'll, that'll work better. Okay, let me see. All right, I got it. Here we go. So my name is Brother Chevis Davis, all right? If you didn't know my name, uh, that's how you spell it. Some people uh, don't know how to spell it, but that's how you spell it. The I is like an E sound. 
But I'm going to tell you a little bit about me as we get going, because as we talk about obedience, I want you to understand, um, understand how obedience works. So some people are born into this world and they spend most of their lives trying to figure out what their purpose and their passion is, right? We wake up, we go to elementary school, some of us learn to sing, some of us learn to dance, some of us learn to draw, and we start to figure out these little gifts as we go through. But some of us don't have those um, expressive gifts, like singing, dancing, and, and drawing, and acting. So we try to find out those gifts throughout our, our lives, and we spend the majority of our lives trying to figure out what that gift is. I did not have that luxury. When I was very young, I was baptized when I was six. So when I was very young, God had already purposed me to do what I was supposed to do. And um, I've been strong in the church ever since. So as Proverbs 18, 16 says, a man's gifts makes room for him and bringeth before great men. And God has really blessed me in those things. But in doing so, uh, I had to develop who I was as an individual. And um, of course, we're going to lead up to, to everything. But as an individual, uh, I became a disruptor. Okay, can somebody define that for me? And if, um, if someone has a mic, we're gonna, I'm going to be putting you to work today. Can somebody define what a disruptor is on this morning? Disruptor. All right, anybody? We got no hands? Okay, Sister Pam, back there. Very good. St challenging the status quo. You have something, Brother Julius? One who causes chaos. One who causes chaos, okay? So a disruptor. So I became a disruptor very young in my life because uh, I always challenged the status quo. You know, being a creative and, you know, realizing my gift, I always had to challenge things. I got in trouble a lot with my parents. I didn't get beaten because I wasn't bad, but I was just a challenging uh, child, okay? So I discovered that I was a disruptor, all right? I didn't know what I was doing at the time, but I was doing it, all right? And then uh, I realized that I was a change agent, all right? Can somebody define what a change agent is? A change agent? Can somebody define that? Anybody? All right. We got the young people in here as well, so that's good because they can they can help glean some from the team. Anybody got a change agent? No one. Okay, Julius, good. Star star pupil. Let me, let me bring you the mic, Doc. <laughs> I'll meet you halfway. Thank you. Someone trying to be a different person. Okay, someone trying to be a different person. It's also a scientific term that makes one chemical or substance change to another one, all right? It works in different various things, like so maybe you have some bakers in a room, you take one agent, which is one substance, put it with another substance, and then it changes to be, we can have yeast and we can have flour and all those things. So a change agent is something that helps something else change, okay? And in doing so, I became a change agent because I helped uh, many, if you didn't know, I was a teacher for 14 years. I helped students change, I helped athletes change, become better, and then, uh, number three is what my wife always called me, which I realized much later in life, a rebel, okay? I became a rebel. Um, laws that are set out for most people, you know, I, I broke them, okay? I repent if anybody's going to challenge me. But laws that, laws that say no U-turn, and I'm like, there's no traffic coming. You know, this is an easy way to get around. You know, I'd make the U-turn, okay? Those, that's my rebellious nature, you know? Teachers say stay inside the lines. I'm going outside the lines, all right? So those three things would really define me as I came to as an individual, a disruptor, a chain agent, and a rebel. But you know who else was all these things? Anybody can take a guess? You know who else was all these things? You said you? Okay. So we brother of faith. We faith. Uh, Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus Christ was all of these things. And if we are to be Christ-like, we have to be disruptors in this world. Amen? We got to be change agents. When we're in a classroom, when we're in a workplace, when we're somewhere amongst other people, we should be a change agent to be able to change the lives of other people. And we're in a community. We should be changing the lives to the people around us. And Jesus was a rebel. He was a rebel. Whether you like it or not, you may not like the term, but Jesus was that. He did not do what the Pharisees said. He did not do what the Sadducees said. He constantly challenged the status quo and did things outside of the box. When they wanted to throw rocks and stones at people, Jesus said no. He rode in that sand, he rode on that ground. He says, you cast the first stone. He rebelled against the very nature of the people around him. And so I'm challenging you all today to be able to, be able to change agent, to be a rebel, 
and to be able to disrupt and change the status quo of the areas that you in. Now, we're talking about this because someone may look at me as a difficult person, all right? And we're talking about dealing with difficult people. And so, um, and I'm not doing this as a shameless plug. I'm doing it because I want you to understand what I've been able to do within my life to help other people change, okay? So I have a company called Paint With Faith back in Miami. Our motto is, your life is a canvas painted with faith. But I have created a process to deal with difficult people through my business, all right? And the reason that I've done that is because I want people to experience what we teach people every single day is faith, all right? Faith is not so easy for some people. Sometimes it's a challenge. And so through my business, I want to teach people how they can exercise their faith. Because we have a great commission, amen? Go into all the world and teach the gospel. All right? That's what our, gospel, our, our, our mission is, but I also use it within my business. All right? So my process, and I'm going to get some participation with you all on today. My process is these things. Okay? Number one, I give an introduction. All right? When we're dealing with difficult people, all right, and I'm sure we've all dealt with someone. Anybody ever dealt with a difficult person? All right, any of us ever been the difficult person? All right, good. I got some, all right, I got some co-patrons in the gospel here with me. All right, amen. So when we're dealing with difficult people, and we all have at some point or another, or will, it's always an introduction needed, okay? When you go to a new job, your coworker may not like you, all right? When a new boss comes to your job, you may be like, who is he? Why is he here? When you get a new teacher, all right, young people, when you get a new teacher, why is she here now? But they always need an introduction because that introduction is going to give that first impression. All right, again, we're dealing with difficult people. So that first introduction may break the barrier of them being difficult. So at each one of my classes, I introduce myself because I'm coming to a group of people who have no art experience, all right, no experience of, of what I'm about to do. So I come in, I say, greetings, my name is Chevis, all right? And I need y'all to participate. Y'all ready to participate? So I'll say, hello, my name is Chevis. Everybody say, hi, Chevis. Hi, Chevis. All right, so that breaks the ice, okay? So when you're dealing with difficult people, that might be the first step for you to at least break the ice. They may seem difficult, but when you make that first introduction, you introduce yourself, you tell them who you are, what you're about, then you can kind of get over that difficult step. You can change difficult people. They don't have to remain difficult people. All right, so that, that would be my first step in my process. The second step is what we came to do. So when you're dealing with difficult people, you introduce yourself, they may still have a guard up. All right, why is he here? What is, why is she here? I don't like the dress she's wearing. I don't like the shirt he got on. I hate that tie. They may be difficult, not ready for the change, okay? So you tell them what we came to do. Why well, I came here to give everybody a raise. Guess what? That guard is gonna go down in that office, right? Because <laughs> because he came and told them what he came to do. All right, so within my business, I do the same thing. I tell them who I am. We are Paint With Faith. We're a motivational painting company. All right, we're here to encourage you through art and exercise faith. Oh, really? Okay, another guard may be taken now. You may still have some difficult people in the group, but at least some is going down, all right? So when you're dealing with difficult people, let them know what you came to do, all right? I'm here to share the gospel with you. Oh, I thought you were just coming to sell me some Girl Scout cookies. And you never know what it is, all right? So you want to let them know what you came to do, all right? Then there's a call and response. The purpose of this is kind of help the whole room uh, get the idea of what's about to happen, all right? So in my class, I'll say, as the words say here, and I'm going to have you repeat after me, all right? If I believe. If I believe. All right, we're going to try that again, okay? If I believe. If I believe. I can, I can achieve. All right, so when you do that call and response, that kind of gets the group together because some friends may be pushing each other, oh, yeah, I can believe. I can achieve. And then you get the, the parents and the child involved if they're in the room. You get the husband, wife involved if they're in the room. And now you got another guard taken down, all right, because you have interaction. The preacher know about this when he say, let the church say amen. He's trying to break that guard for the difficult people who may be tight. They may have had a bad morning. Whatever it is. Being able to say those words can open up and bring down that difficulty, all right? So that's another part of my process. The next thing is to take away inhibitions, all right? When you're dealing with difficult people, they may feel like, oh, I don't know how to use a brush. I don't know how to paint. I don't know how to sing. That's why I don't sing in church. All those, 
you got to be able to take away, give no excuse. So I say in my classes, we're an art company. So we believe there is no mistakes in art. And they're like, oh, if I can't make a mistake, then every part that I do is going to be good. So when you go into a space with difficult people, you let them know, listen, I know you've been on this job for 25 years, but guess what? We're going to wash away all the mistakes you made. Oh, yeah, and I'm going to give you a raise. Oh, OK. <laughs> all right. No inhibitions. All right, I can do this job effectively now that I know that you're on my team, OK? So you want to be able to take away inhibitions when you're dealing with difficult people, and it's going to help you move along in the process. Next one is to remove negativity, all right? If you can remove negativity from a difficult person, then they have no reason to be difficult, OK? So this is another part of our process and our classes. We remove the ne negativity. So I'm going to have everybody snap their fingers, all right? This is to remove negativity out the space, OK? Now, as you're snapping the fingers, I tell them, hey, listen, we're snapping. So if you think something negative, you're going to snap out the negativity. If you say something negative, you're going to snap out the negativity. And if somebody around you says something negative, you're going to look at them and snap, snap, snap out their negativity, all right? So that's part of our process. So what that helps us do is to get everybody on the same page. And if you have a space with negative people or difficult people and you're having trouble getting the people next to them on the same page, they have a friend in that office. They have a friend in that classroom. They have a friend in that space. And that friend can be your ally to help that difficult person be on your team. Amen? Yeah. So there's a you, me, us process. So listen, you look at yourself, you're like, you know what? I'm thinking something negative, I can snap it out. All right? They're thinking something negative, I'm going to snap out theirs. So throughout our classes, Whenever we hear snapping in the classes, we know that somebody next to them has done something negative, and it controls the classroom. So now we can get rid of all the negative people. But sometimes all those steps still don't work. Yeah, sometimes. Yeah. All right, somebody testified. Sometimes all of that still doesn't work, OK? And the last step that we use is we have to encourage them. Yeah, yeah. Amen? Sometimes when you're dealing with negative people, you've done all of these things, all right? As I'm doing today, I'm watching throughout the, the whole class, all right? I'm looking for the people that are still being difficult, all right? And the last thing you do is you encourage that person. And I've had classes where I went through the whole intro and their arms still folded tight. Their face still in the grimace. They still say, I'm not going to paint, even though I made the setup for them. And I say, Miss Mary, you're not going to paint? No, I'm not painting. I hate painting. One time I messed up painting when I was 12 years old. I'm 86 now, and I'll never paint again. <laughs> These are real life stories. I'm not making this up. This is real life stories that happened to me on the job. All right? And we teach people from 2 years old to 102 years old. We've had clients, I think the oldest was 108, that painted with us for the first time. They lived the whole century and never painted before. And so we've had that. And I want to let you all know, there's the two most difficult people in the world, or a group of people, are middle school people and senior citizens. OK? I'm sorry, sorry to bear the bad news. But middle school students and senior citizens, OK? Those two. So just imagine having a, a group of middle school students and senior citizens together, all right? We have a, I got my work cut out at those times, all right? So, after all those steps, we got to have some encouragement, all right? So I read a book that was called um, The ABCs of Building a Business Team That Wins, all right? And building a team that wins, one of the quotes in the book is says, the goals of the team, but I said group, the goals of the group are more important than the individual. That's pretty deep, right? So the goals of the church are more important than the individual. Let me say that one more time. The goals of the church are more important than the individual. So when we have a mission, what's the mission, Brother Preacher? No, for, the, for this season, we call it what? Operation? Restoration. There you go. So that's our mission as a congregation. So if he put that out for all of us, if somebody say, I don't like that, it doesn't matter because the goals of the group, the goals of the church are more important than the individual. Another premise to the book, it says when someone breaches the rules or the code, you have to call it. All right? So if we all got on our um, Operation Restoration shirts, 
and somebody come with another shirt on, we said we all wearing our shirts, you gotta call it. Hey, brother, why are you still wearing that, that Fendi shirt? You know, why you got on your Gucci shirt? You're supposed to be wearing the Operation Restoration. And like I said at the beginning, I am a disruptor. All right, I am a rebel. And so if those, those rules are breached, we have to be able to call it. All right, and that's important because we gotta be able to encourage each other, but I only help each other get to the next level. We all trying to go to heaven, right? Oh, okay, I wanna make sure we all get there together. So we have to make sure we have the right standards, the right codes, we have the right rules, and all those things should be outlined within uh, the group so we can all understand. Because one thing about difficult people, they can argue with you if there are no rules or standards set. All right? Well, you didn't say we had to do that. Nobody ever told me. Where is that written? Is that in the fine print? Why don't you post it up? When you're dealing with difficult people, if you have rules, they won't challenge your, your, your presence or your leadership. So as long as you have the standards set, difficult people will fall in line if they know what they need to fall in line to. Amen? But when you're dealing with difficult people, say, hey, we said we will be here at 10 o'clock. It's 11.15. Well, nobody ever told me it was going to be there at 10 o'clock. You didn't send me a text. You didn't send me an email. But if everybody in the room know that it's 10 o'clock, then that person cannot challenge that authority. And all they have to do is what? Apologize. All right? So we're going to move forward. Anybody like taking tests? Oh, okay. All right. No? Okay. Well, I, some, some people may like taking tests. I don't like taking tests. Okay, we got one person over here. Good. Well, we all know that without a test, we don't have a what? Testimony. All right? So in order for us to kind of know where we are, where we stand, whether it's in school, whether it's at work, whether it's our personal development, we got to be challenged. We got to be tested. And when you're dealing with difficult people, you got to know that you got to go through a process in order to get where you need to get to, all right? So I, I chose uh, 1 Samuel uh, 34 through 37 because David has a great testimony. So some of you who may not know me, David is one of my, my favorite people in the Bible. He has a great story uh, that can touch anybody at any age because it goes his whole life of all the things that he dealt with. The Bible says he's a man after God's own heart, but he also messed up a lot. All right, he went through all the stuff that we go through as men uh, and was challenged for all those things. It showed his pride, it showed his arrogance, it showed his lust, it showed his desires, it shows his fallings, but it also shows all of his strengths and his perseverance even when he does mess up, all right? So I love David. And so it says, verse uh, 33, uh, King says, you don't have to, a chance against him. And we're talking about David and Goliath, all right? It's the same David. So I replied, you're only a boy, and he's been a soldier all his life. So number one, we can't discount people by their age, all right? Let's not do that. I've met some very wise kids, you know, in my years of teaching. I met some very challenged kids. And all those scenarios have shown me that I can be humbled by what they can do and what they've been through. Amen? So when you're dealing with difficult people, it uh, doesn't matter what age they are. I know that everybody has something to bring to the table. And so it says, but David told him, your majesty, I take care of my father's sheep. Amen? That sound familiar? And when, we, uh, when one of them is dragged off by a lion or a bear, I go after it and beat the wild animal until he lets the sheep go. If the wild animal turns and attacks me, I grab it by the throat and kill it. Sir, I have killed lions and bears that way, and I can kill this worthless Philistine. He shouldn't have made a fun of the army of the living God. The Lord has rescued me from the claws of the lions and bears, and he will keep me safe from the hands of the Philistine. All right, Saul answered, go ahead and fight him. I hope the Lord will help you. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, yes, chapter 17. I'm sorry for anyone who's writing notes. Chapter 17, uh, and the verses are 34 to 37. I apologize for that as a typo. So go just read the whole chapter, and you'll be all right. All right? <laughs> I appreciate that, preacher. Um, so with that testimony, David was able to encourage Samuel, I mean Saul, right? And he was able to show him 
his resume, all right? Now, when a difficult person is in the room, sometimes you got to show them your resume. You got to show them what you've been through, because sometimes your missions will align, which will also allow you guys to be able to work together, and that difficulty will be out the way. I found, too, that some of the most difficult people have some of the best skills. Some of the most difficult people have some of the best skills. And if you get them on your team, then you have a championship team. Anybody ever heard of Kobe? Uh, I something. Was Kobe difficult? Yeah, they say he was very difficult to work with. All right. Y'all heard of Michael Jordan? They say he was difficult too. That's my boy. <laughs> Anybody ever heard of Steve Jobs? Steve Jobs, if your kids don't know, Apple. All right, he invented Apple, the whole company, billionaire. Very difficult to work with. But once you have this person on your team and you get down the levels of, of difficulty, then you have a star player. Yeah. All right? Oh, so y'all ready for y'all test? Oh, I, guess, I, guess, I guess not. So we're going we gonna to work on some things on today. All right? So I'm going to challenge everybody on today. Y'all ready? Can y'all name at least one of the things I am from the beginning? Disruptor. What else am I? Rebel. Rebel. What's the last one? A change agent. All right. So I, I personify all those things. And uh, my wife gave me permission that I don't have to apologize anymore for who I am as a person. Amen. Thank you. I got one hand clap. <laughs> I appreciate you. So what we're going to do, we're going to give everybody a test on the day. All right. Because we got people spread all around the church. So I want everybody to come up to the front, at least these first three rows and these two sections, all right? So that's y'all test for today. I need everybody to come all the way up to these first two sections, because we can fill this up, all right? I'm going to give y'all about one minute. All right, we talked about obedience. So I want all the people that spread all the way out to come to these first uh, three rows. Y'all can sit on the front, too, with me, so I can have somebody to talk to. And then we're going to finish out this lesson. All right, I'll give you all about one minute. What's the name of the lesson? What, what are we talking about? Dealing with difficult people. And so this is our test for the day. All right, these first three rows and only these two sections. All right, that's our test for the day. So by the end of the day, we can have a testimony. All right, amen, amen. Glory to God. Glory to God. I understand, I understand. But we blessed in this building, right? Amen. Are we covered by the blood of the Lamb? Yes, we when the children of Israel uh, was having a ten plagues, weren't they covered? Yes. Didn't God protect them? Yes, he did. Are we, is, is it the same God? Yes, he is. So we're not worried about all the things that's going to stop us from what we need to do in faith. We're not going to also stop when God gives us a, a message. Amen. We're not going to stop when God tells us to be obedient. Ma'am, don't sit down yet. Don't sit down yet. We're coming up here. We're coming up here in this section right here. So all the people who just came in, we're coming up here uh, towards the front. All right? All right? So there we go. So now, that was our test for today. All right? So now we have a testimony. Brother Davidson made us move from our favorite seat. It was nice and warm. Now I got to sit in this cold spot. I got to be next to these people who I don't want to be next to. And, um, and I'm going to complain about COVID, and I'm going to say my legs didn't hurt. I'm going to say all these things. But when we're dealing with difficult people, the first thing we need to do is do what? Look in the mirror. In the mirror. All right? When we're dealing with or talking about difficult people, first thing we need to do is look in the mirror. And I'll be the first to admit I could be challenging to work with. Can I get one amen? My whole family know. I could be, I could be a challenging person to work with. I can be difficult sometimes too, because when I want it my way, I want it my way. Amen? amen. Let Davidson say amen. <laughs> so when you're dealing with difficult people, the first thing you need to do is to be able to look in the mirror. All right? Now. Seven habits of incredibly difficult people. 
All right, I'll give you a second to kind of absorb before we dig into it. Seven habits of incredibly difficult people. The my way or the highway mentality. Anybody ever heard of that? The highway or the my way mentality. Anybody have a, a boss like that? Now, I don't want to I I hold the whole floor, so I'll leave some, um, some space. Anybody got a comment or question? Why are we in the middle? Comment or question? Okay, good. All right, so the my way or the highway mentality are people who have it all set up the way they want it to be. The table cover's got to be set this way. They got to be this specific color. Whatever it is, but it's my way or the highway. If you don't like it, you can leave. Anybody know anybody like that? Know a few? Amen, amen. Number two, they perpetuate arguments rather than solve them. They perpetuate arguments rather than solve them. Now, uh, you know, going to a lot of congregations, I've been a part of about six or seven congregations, and um, what I've learned from those congregations is that they say, when you see two people arguing, can you tell which one looks like the fool? <laughs> which one? Both of them. Both of them look like the fool. They just going off, arms flailing, they in each other's face, spit is flying. When two people are arguing, you can't tell which one is the fool, nor can you tell which one is right. All right? So they like to perpetuate arguments rather than solve them. So you say, hey, listen, man, I think we should go ahead and do it this way. But last time we did it that way. But this time we're going to do it this way. Well, so-and-so said we should do it that way. But I think we should go through the process of, well, last time and this, and they just keep going. They never get a resolve, and they will keep perpetuating the argument rather than find a, a solution. They can at least say, hey, let's try it. If it doesn't work, we'll try it the old way, right? That's problem solving. All right, we're dealing with difficult people. Oh, you got a question? We got a comment right here? Uh, mm-hmm. OK, since you're here, take this. <laughs> <laughs> but usually, the one you arguing with is the one that you love the most. Mm. But in most cases, sometimes you just have to, you might say, give up the right for the wrong, mm -hmm. just for the sake of argument. Right. right. You know, and sometimes you just have to let things go. Now I know sometimes, I'm speaking for myself, mm -hmm. nobody else, but sometimes in my, in my case, sometimes we, my wife and I might have a disagreement, an argument, whatever you want, might want to call. You don't say I'll that. go for a walk, take yeah. a ride, do yeah. something. Mm -hmm. Good. When you go, <laughs> and when you are, you know, come back, that, that kinds of, I think they, they, you know, we'll come back home, everything is all right. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, you got to look at the situation. Because it's one thing I've learned in life. My father, and thank God for my mother and father. Mm -hmm. They dead and gone now, but still in all, the things that they taught us still is still in me. Mm -hmm. They taught us that it takes two to argue. If you right. stand around and argue and argue and argue, next thing you know, you're going to do something that you're going to be sorry of. Exactly. You know, and because... For me, I'm not going to be in jail. I'm not going to be in the inside looking out for anybody. <laughs> I know that's right. <laughs> you know, so that's why sometimes it just pays just to perpetuate, just to, I mean, to put into the situation, just forget about things, especially if it doesn't make any sense, you know, and exactly. it doesn't matter anyways, you know. And sometimes it's just got to go ahead and resolve itself, all right? And so when you get into arguments and you perpetuate the argument, someone has to be the bigger person to be able to find a resolve, all right? So when you're dealing with difficult people, they may be the ones that's just going around the circles with the argument, and like Brother Johnny said, you just gotta let it go. Let it go and come back to it again. And like he said last week, I was, I was listening, he says the person years, well, like a year later came back and apologized for doing wrong, all right? So um, one thing you, we need to realize, and when we get into these arguments, and I, you know, I read this article and it says, arguments are an attack on your personal are an attack on your personal character. A lot of sometimes you have people that do call your names and things like that. It's not about you, it's against the other person. It's both of you trying to come to an understanding. 
And that's usually the case with difficult people. You just haven't found a place of understanding where you can move forward. And in order for us to like build a team that wins or a group that, that wins, we have to put aside some of the things that's disrupting us to bring it together to get the goal or the mission accomplished, all right? Another thing, number three, they are self-absorbed. I know y'all don't know anybody like that. <laughs> so a difficult person may think highly of themselves. They grasp onto their ego, all right, as if it's their life source. Reasoning with someone like this can be very difficult. It can feel difficult, and they're often disrespectful to other people because they're projected self-image. All right, so difficult people may be uh, maybe what you call a narcissist, all right, somebody who's very arrogant, and it's all about them. Like, hey, man, we all going to go to the movies, but wait, man, I got to go get my best outfit first. All right, I can't leave yet because my shoes, you know, not as clean as I want them. It's like, listen, we need to be there at 8. Oh, well, y'all going to have to leave me because I need to make sure I look fresh when I go out. All right? So t sometimes dealing with difficult people, you'll find that they are very self-absorbed. I had a friend, I'm not going to say his name. But uh, we all went to the same college together. It was, just, it was a group of four of us. We're all artists. We went to middle school, high school, and college together. And so uh, my first friend was picking him up in the morning, and he likes to be on time. My friend was always making him late. He said, Chevis, you're going to take the next ride. I like to be on time, too. So I'm picking him up for a couple of weeks. He started making me late. I said, hey, man, you got to take the ride now. So our latest friend, because both of them like to be late, he was the one that took up all the time because my friend would be taking a long shower and getting primped and pressed just to go to college. And so we found that you know he was so self-absorbed that he would make himself late and try to make us late. So we had to let him go because that was making our lives difficult. All right, they don't take responsibility. Anybody ever heard of a person like that? It's not my fault, I didn't do it. Um, it's not me, it's you. All right, so difficult people tend to not take responsibility for their difficulty. It's always somebody else's fault. And so when you're dealing with difficult people, you got to realize that if they're never going to take responsibility, they have to see it for themselves. All right, um, how do you change this? Excuses, blaming, and complaining are all the things that need to go. It might be hard to admit that you've made a bad choice or unintentionally hurt someone, but you can only make matters worse by shifting the focus uh, from yourself. I found another book I read, if, if you're a bigger person, if you want to succeed, if you want to be a leader, you take all the responsibility. As a leader, you got to take all responsibility. And I had to absorb that because, you know, I'm a leader in my space. So if we miss a class, it's my fault because I didn't call to check up. All right, if a client calls and give us a bad uh, review, it's my fault because I didn't maybe teach the person the right way. Uh, if they didn't have enough supplies, my fault because I didn't fill, you know, the supplies. And so as a leader, if you take full responsibility, then you have nobody else to blame. And it can make you an even more successful person because you got to remember, if it's my fault, I can't mess up on myself. All right, so when you're dealing with difficult people, even though they don't take responsibility, you can say to them, you know what, it's my fault. And guess what, you just knocked another wall down. And that difficult person may be like, wow, you know, he humbled himself. Maybe it was my fault. Or maybe I can help him be better. Like we said at the beginning, those difficult people could be your greatest allies when you want to be successful. All right, so we're at number four. Here we go. Seven habits of incredibly difficult people. Their mind is fixed. Anybody want to say something about that? Their mind is fixed. You try to explain something to them. Oh, we got a comment right here. <laughs> Uh-oh. No matter what you say mm -hmm. and how you say it, it's going to be their way or no, like say their way or no way. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's because it's a problem with themselves. You're exactly right. We got another comment behind you too. <laughs> <laughs> We got more testimonies in here. <laughs> Difficult people also, they have tunnel vision. They only see one way, one road. They don't see anything on the sides. They can't take in any uh, suggestions from anyone else because all they see 
is what's in front of them and what they see is the right thing in their mind. That's right. Their mind is fixed. Well, you can change their mind if you have the right sauce, all right? Sometimes these type of people will say, you know, I'm the type of person that, you be like, you the type of person that? That's, that's all that you are? Or they'll say things like, that's just something I don't do. I'm like, dog, okay, well, we, we just trying to raise funds for the, to get the door fixed. Well, that's just not something I would give to. Me, myself, and then they start to explain what me, myself does. And I always ask the question, who sold you on this plan to stay the same? Who sold you on the plan to stay the way you are? And sometimes we got to ask ourselves that question. If you fixed on who you are, how are you going to ever grow? How are you going to ever grow if you decide to stay the same person? There's no way to grow if you decide to stay the same. Well, I have a degree in math. I'm not going to teach anything but math. But there's nobody hiring mathematicians. So what are you going to do? I only want to, you know, write a book, but there's a script here for you to make a movie. So we got to be able to understand that when we're dealing with difficult people, or we are that difficult person, we got to be ready to change. If you give a difficult person another option, then guess what? You could break down another wall. Mary, I know you've been in, you know, accounts payable all this time, but there's a position open, you know, for doing something else. But inventory, in and out, it's going to pay $20,000 more. But all I know is accounts payable. But $20,000 more, you'll be supervising these people instead of doing the work you've been doing. But I only know this. And then Mary missed the opportunity. A lot of times when we fix our minds, we're missing opportunities. All right? Number six, they don't reflect on their life. They don't reflect on their life. Uh, difficult people uh, tend to completely forego and remembering what they've done in the past. Anybody ever made a mistake? Yes, I have. Okay. I thought I was the only one. <laughs> they don't reflect on their life. And if you're dealing with a difficult person, they really don't remember all the mistakes that they made or all the offenses that they've done all this time. But if you begin to remind them, you start knocking down those walls again. Well, you remember that time you came an hour late to work and, you know, I didn't tell anybody and I made sure that you clocked in and got your full pay? Yeah, I do remember that. You remember that time when, you know, your son never came on that night and I came over your house and went with you to find your son? Do you remember that time I stood up for you when everybody was talking bad about you and you was out for 10 weeks and they didn't know you were sick, they thought you was just skipping work? So when you remind those difficult people what you've done for them or what somebody else has done for them, because we all have bad times, right? We all need some help sometimes, right? It's the reason we're here, all right? We all go to the hospital when we're sick, right? When we're spiritually sick, we come to the Lord. And so if we didn't think we needed help, we wouldn't even be here on the day, amen? So people who are difficult, they forget. They have amnesia of all the things that happened in their past, and they're not able to, to bring it to fruition to be able to put down the guard to be a better person. Number seven, they don't take care of themselves. They don't take care of themselves. What does that mean, Brother Davis? Difficult people tend to be the ones who may say, oh, I only got four hours of sleep last night, or they brag about it. Or they're the person say, I haven't eaten all day. And while that might seem good in some circumstances, people that are difficult maybe going through something physically that's making them difficult. Anybody ever been groggy when they woke up? Only a few of us? Oh, I raised my hand twice for that. When I'm in a good sleep, somebody wake me up, I'm gonna be real groggy. And so sometimes people are being difficult not because they're a difficult person, but because they just got up an hour ago. Or they gotta get up in a rush. Or they wasn't ready to get up. Or something may have happened that prevented them from being their better self. Anybody ever been hangry? All right. All right. So people that don't know what hangry means, it means you're hungry, and now you're angry because you're hungry. All right. And a lot of times people are grumpy, and they're very difficult because they ain't eat. All right. And that happens to me a lot. My wife say, what's the matter with you? Did you eat? 
That's what you already know. After I eat, whole mood change. Sometimes that's the difficult nature. You ever seen the, the snack commercials? No. All right, the people just acting crazy. They have a celebrity sometimes being a person. As soon as they give them a snicker, they turn back to their regular selves. Because, you know, not going anywhere, you hungry, grab a snicker. And so sometimes you got to get rid of that hunger. Some people might need to get sleep. And um, that will help to change the whole difficulty. And then sometimes they need that coffee. Oh, there you go. See, I don't drink coffee, so I don't know what that's like. But some people may need that coffee. I've seen shirts. I've seen jackets. I've seen towels. I say, not yet till I have my coffee. You have a comment or you need coffee? <laughs> I need both. <laughs> this sounds a lot like depression. Because mm -hmm. people who have depression, this is the kind of stuff they do. Exactly. Exactly. And so we find, too, there might be a mental health issue there. So we may just take uh, difficult people for surface value. But as Christians, we need to be able to dig deeper into what the situation is. And that's why we're going through this. Because sometimes we could call out difficult people all the time. Don't work with her. She always going to fight you. Don't work with him. He always got something to say. But they may have something completely different going on in their house, in their school, in their life. And I'll tell you one story. I had a student who was always being late to class every day. And this is when I worked in elementary. And um, this was fourth grade. And I said, um, I don't remember her name, Jonisha. Jonisha, why are, you, why are you always late every day? She said, well, I got to get my brother and sister ready for school. I said, you in the fourth grade. You got to get your siblings ready? Yeah, my mom didn't come home last night, so I got to get them ready for school. That broke my heart. Because as a teacher, you're just trying to make sure you get the job done. But you find out all of these different issues that's going on in their life. You find the kids that we call bad acting up in school, but there's something personal going on in their life. And when you're dealing with difficult people, you got to realize that there's something else that's making them difficult. Another student uh, come in with an attitude every morning. It was always on Mondays, too. Monday, she would come in with a bad attitude drop her head on the desk, and just won't participate in class. Now, I'm Mr. Davis. I'm the favorite teacher in the school, OK? <laughs> I'm the funnest class. I got art, all right? And I treat the kids like they my nieces and nephews. You know, they come in, and people that with negativity not allowed in my room. So if they come to the door with negativity, then they get rejected, because my room is filled with love, you know? Like I said in the beginning, we've got to be able to personify Jesus, Jesus Christ. So if you want to come in my art class, it's got to be with love. No negativity, no fighting nobody, don't come in here saying nothing negative. That was my class. So she would come in. She was a good student, but she would come in on Mondays where they put her head on the desk and not participate. And I'd say, hey, you know, what's going on? And then come to find out that her dad was on drugs. And when he got paid on Friday, he take his check and he goes on a bench and doesn't come back till Monday morning. And then this particular time, her mom used to sell food, you know, in order to make money. I said, hey, you know, why your mom selling food? And then she told me the story. But this time, he found the mom's stash and took his check and the money she had made from selling plates and was gone for the week. And so she was being difficult because she has something underlying that was going on in her personal life. So as we look at these type of people and we look at difficult people, we got to realize that as children of God, we got to find out what the real issue really is. Give them some compassion, give them some love to help them get through the next situation. All right? Because being difficult, you don't just make life difficult for others. You make life more difficult for yourself. Who wants to hire a difficult person? Who want to go and pray for a difficult person? Who want to go fellowship with a difficult person? And when you have difficult people, they're missing out on all the blessings that can come into the life because they're being difficult. But if we can get past that barrier, or if we can become a better person without being difficult, we can get more blessings. I'm not going to tell a difficult person there's a job opening, because when I go there, they're going to make an excuse of why they don't need to apply. So let's keep moving forward. We're going to talk about beliefs, all right? A lot of difficult people have a lot of beliefs, all right? And beliefs are just repeated thoughts and not necessarily facts. All right? 
It's just repeated thoughts, not necessarily fact. We talked about earlier that I'm the person that type, I'm the person that I only, and so they repeat this to themselves until they begin to believe it. And it's not even factual. A lot of people call me short, right? I never believed it. I still don't. I just think that people are tall. And so I don't present myself as a short person. I never believed it. And so sometimes what people will continually tell you, you will begin to believe. And I want you to understand today that you don't have to believe those thoughts. We are people of faith, right? And with that faith, the Bible says we can do all things. So to me, I'm a tall person because I'm taller than elementary kids, right? <laughs> and I'm taller than some middle school kids. So actually, I'm not really short. I'm just the right height for who I'm supposed to be. <laughs> Sometimes we need to mentor people. Sometimes they're missing something. Am I good on time? Okay, good on time. All right. Sometimes mentoring needs to be involved. I even have people difficult because they feel like they have a lack of skills. But when you build a relationship and trust, a difficult person may be the way because they are lacking trust in others or others in them. Therefore, they spend, spend time building your relationship and trust with each other. Um, sometimes you may have a team of basketball players, team of football players. And you may have a great athlete. I mean, my son was talking about this this week. that He has a friend who's a great athlete. When it came game time, he wasn't that great. At game time, he never showed up. But in practice, he's outstanding. That's where mentoring need to be involved. All right? Because they need to make the transition to be a great player on the field and off the field. And sometimes when you're dealing with difficult people, you see difficult people, friends with a lot of people, except you. You ever seen that? You see them kiki and laughing with whoever. And you're like, I thought that was a difficult person but they're just being difficult with you because there may be a barrier that's outlined. Sometimes you might need to just take that person out to lunch and hash out what the problem is. <laughs> Sometimes you just gotta find out what's that blockage between you. Well, you took the position that I wanted. Oh, I didn't even know you want that position. As a matter of fact, I didn't know who you were. Somebody asked you to do something and they wanted to do it. Well, why didn't you say anything? Well, I didn't think they would give me the position. And so the difficulty is not really personally on you. It's just the whole scenario was painted the wrong way. And when you're dealing with difficult people, sometimes building relationship will put that person on your team. Well, let's do it together. I don't know what I'm doing no way. So let's do it together and make successful. You, you, we brought, brought to my memory, I saw this movie. And this, oh, oh, I'm sorry. And this girl didn't like the other girl. And she didn't realize, why you don't like me? And finally she talked it out because I wanted that position. Mm -hmm. And they gave it to you, and you only been here a short time. Mm -hmm. So they worked it out to work together. And the girl finally, she went up higher, and the girl got that position that she wanted. Exactly. It'll happen. I'm not telling stories. This is real life stuff from personal experiences. Wait, she got a comment. Also, sometimes people, you may be the one person that makes a person look at themselves. So they may not, that may make them feel uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So they're going to congregate with people like them so that they can have those same behaviors or conduct themselves the way that they do so they don't have to see themselves or look at themselves or change their behaviors. Exactly, exactly. We had another comment right here, then we're going to get you, sister. Yeah, you know, just this past Thursday morning, I did a substitute run for another driver. And, you know, the way the drivers talk about the kids and how bad they are and everything, it, was, it made me kind of wonder, am I, you know, am I doing the right thing? But anyway, I took that run, to make a long story short, and which is a true story, is uh, I took the run, and when the kids came on the bus, you know, I introduced myself to the kids, let them know who I was. I said, we're not going to tolerate this. You're fighting the monitor, and you're doing this and that. And it was a smooth, very smooth transition. Mm -hmm. And uh, 
I told her, I was saying to my mother, I said, you know, we only have these kids for about half an hour at the most. Think about the parents who's got them for a lifetime, you know. And, and so, anyways, the attendant said to me, said, why did the kids be so good for you this morning? And when the regular driver's on, they loud, they fight the monitor. I said, because I, I just, I treat them like I would my own kids, you know. I mean, I, I do, I love what I do. I love it. Not so much as, you know, that uh, it's for the money and what have you, but I just love people, especially kids, you know, because I got kids, grandkids, great grandkids, and I thank God that I, I am where I am now. Right. You know, and so, I don't know, I treat those kids like they're my own kids. And that's, and that's what we need to do sometimes. We got to yep. be able to uh, project, we have one in the back over here, project uh, what we want from that individual. If they're being difficult, maybe we can project uh, the way that we want to see or even model. And sometimes people just insecure. They judge. Mm -hmm. If they see someone got high self-esteem, they don't want to deal with that person. Right. Uh, I always say being uncomfortable is the best way that you can grow. Anybody know, any, know anything about a hermit crab? You ever heard of that hermit crab? Do y'all know the stories about hermit crabs? So hermit crabs constantly change their shell. Okay? So they go in one shell and they begin to grow. And that shell begets, gets uncomfortable. So they got to go to another shell and they grow and it gets uncomfortable. But they keep shelling off to get a bigger and a better shell for their life because it gets uncomfortable. And we have to be able to do that. If we want to be able to grow, we got to get uncomfortable. We just came from sunny South Florida, all right? <laughs> but in order for us to grow, we had to make a change. We had to be obedient. We had to break down the walls of being difficult. It wasn't easy for us to leave. You know, all our family there, we've never seen snow before we came here. So you want to talk about being uncomfortable, you got four or five people right here that can tell you a story, leaving all their friends and everything. So, but if you want to be able to grow, you got to be able to get uncomfortable. All right? Uh, I want to say that love conquers all. Amen? Love conquers all. All right, I got the right scripture this time, right, preacher? All right, 1 Corinthians 13, it says, again, we're talking about dealing with difficult people. All right? So when you're dealing with difficult people, love is patient. Love is kind. Love is never jealous, boastful, proud, or rude. So we don't want to be those things when we're dealing with difficult people. Love isn't selfish or quick-tempered. Sometimes we've got to be patient when we're dealing with difficult people. Sometimes you've got to play the long game with difficult people. Uh, it doesn't keep a record of wrongs that others do. Love rejoices. All right, I heard somebody laugh. Love rejoices in the truth but not in evil. So even though they've been doing a lot of bad things, they're being very difficult, let's think about the good things that they have done. All right. All right. Love is always supportive, loyal, hopeful, and trusting. Love never fails. We don't know everything, and our prophecies are not complete. But what is perfect will someday appear, and what isn't perfect will then disappear. It says, when we were children, we thought and reasoned as children do. But when we grew grew up, we quit our childish ways. When you're dealing with difficult people, you got to put some of your ways to the side. Now that we can see a God, it's like a cloudy picture in a mirror. Later, we see him face to face. We see him clearly. We don't know everything, but then we will just as God completely understands us. So we got to be able to deal with difficult people as God deal with us. Amen. For now there are faith, hope, and love, but of these three, the greatest is love. When we're dealing with difficult people, the greatest thing that we can do is show them love. And when you have a difficult person, see your love, they can then be on your side and help you achieve the goals that you want to be able to achieve. As we said earlier in the slides, the goals of the church are more important than what? the individual. So we can put our, ourselves aside. If we can put all our things aside, our proclivities, 
what stops us, and what keeps us from using people that God wants us to use, to use people that God wants us to use, to use people that God wants us to use. I know sometimes we tiptoe around certain people in the church. We don't befriend certain people in the church. We stay away from certain people in the church. We don't fellowship with certain people in the church. We have our special group in the church. But God wants us to use all of us. The Bible said we are one body, many members. And if we're working without a kidney, we're not working too well. If our heart is not acting right, we're not going to be doing too good. If we're missing a pinky toe, we're going to lose some balance. So we got to use all our members. We asking everybody. This is a call for everybody on today. This is why God wouldn't let me sleep that morning. We are new here. All right. The Davises are new. And we don't know what half of y'all can do. So I'm, I'm making a call out to you all on today to see what you can do. God is waiting on you. I'm waiting on you. I mentioned on, on New Year's, I'm ready for some cakes and pies and all those things. Let God use you. All right? Let him use you. We got some people that in the pews that can sing. They won't even come up to the front. All right? That's my time. Okay, that's my time. All right, so, again, the three things that I came here to do and that God sent me to do. We didn't know we was coming to Rochester, all right, two years ago. We didn't plan on it. But God said move, and we moved. So we came here to be a disruptor, a change agent, all right? And we're going to rebel some of the things that, that's going on here in this city so that we can make this a better place. The Bible said, as Christians, we're supposed to turn the world upside down. All right? We're going to have some difficulty, but we've got to be able to deal with those difficulties that we learn on today to be able to make this a better place, a better city, and a better community. I thank you guys for your time and, and attention on this morning.